The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. Thank you. Please be seated. Three cases are submitted this afternoon. Those cases are Des Moines Area Regional Transit Authority and United Heartland versus Arbrina Young. Second case is Iowa Ins uh, Insurance Institute, Iowa Defense Association, uh, Iowa Self Insurers Association, Property Casualty Insurers Association, National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies, and Iowa Association of Business and Industry versus a core group of the Iowa Association for Justice, Christopher J. Godfrey, and Iowa Department of Workforce Development. The final case is Iowa Supreme Court Attorney Disciplinary Board versus Kenneth Whelan, Jr. The last case is now submitted to the court without argument, and we'll hear the arguments in the first case, Des Moines Area Regional Transit Authority. Mr. Tucker. May it please the court, counsel. The sole issue before the court today is can an IME, or are the, can the IME costs in a workers' compensation case be awarded under section 8640 and rule 876-4.33 subsection six when reimbursement is unavailable under the ordinary course in 8539. The legal question is, is the agency rule, uh, I just cited, um, irrational, logical, or uh, wholly unjustifiable interpretation of law? Uh, let me give a very brief uh, recitation of the facts, 30 seconds. Uh, in this case, uh, in 2009, my client, Arbrenda Young, was uh, injured in a workers' compensation accident. The, in, insurer, uh, the company admitted liability and went to trial. And the commissioner ordered uh, PPD, medical benefits, and an IME paid taxed as a cost because 8539 was unavailable to her. Uh, despite numerous requests by the claimant, in this case, our Brenna Young, uh, to defense counsel the, um, uh, for an IME, for a rating, um, uh, those were all refused. Um, uh, as a procedural matter, I wasn't the attorney uh, early on in this case. Uh, a sk very skilled attorney, Gary Matson, was, and he made numerous requests to uh, Mr. Uh, Jenkins' client uh, for a uh, rating so that he could get uh, a second rating. Uh, those requests were denied. Um, and on 518 of 10, um, under my uh, carrying on of the case, uh, Dr. Balls did, in fact, give an impairment rating. That second impairment rating, <clears throat> the first impairment rating by Dr. Balls um, was after the impairment rating by Dr. Stoken, which is the subject of this uh, case. Um, so therefore, there was no trigger for an IME reimbursement under 8539, and uh, those, that's the, the setup of the facts. So we got Dr. Stoken's I, claimant's IME first, and then we got Dr. Balls Defense IME second. Um, deny, therefore, automatically, there's no reimbursement possible under 8539. Procedural background is that this case was decided in favor of the claimant uh, at the deputy level, affirmed on the commissioner level, affirmed at the district court level, and the Court of Appeals, in its wisdom, reversed um, based on an 8539 analysis, saying that this case can't be awarded, um, the cost of this case can't be awarded under 8539. Um, but that wasn't the question which was put to them. The question which was put to them is can it be awarded under 8640, which is the cost statute, which is where um, the uh, authority uh, drove from. Um, <coughs> the Court of Appeals indicates that, this, that the cost uh, provision does not include an IME, but it, and, but it doesn't exclude it, but the fact is that it does include under 4.33 subsection six, 
the cost, the reasonable cost of obtaining a medical report from a doctor. And I, 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 I guess the Court of Appeals was confused about the interplay between 8539 and 8640. Does this come down to the meaning of obtaining? Well, the meaning of obtaining is pretty straightforward, I think. I mean, it, what it means to obtain a medical report. And in Caven, which is the case I wanted to talk about, they tax this as a cost, um, because, and that's a court of appeals decision, which is really the reason we're here, because this is a case of first impression. So um, when Caven, what they said was that it was legitimate for, uh, for the fact, in the facts of Caven, an audiologist gave a report. For that report, the uh, commissioner uh, reimbursed Caven for those costs. Okay, um, and basically the case in Caven is exactly the same as here, because in Caven it was an audiologist, a non-doctor, but that non non-doctor um, sat down, reviewed some records, made personal contact with the client, client formed an opinion, and then wrote a r report, which was uh, then um, reimbursed under the, the cost statute. The same thing happened here. Dr. Stoken uh, read some records, made personal contact, uh, wrote a report, or formed opinions, and wrote a report. It's the same thing. And that obtaining in Caven, going to your question, um, is the same mechanism of reimbursement under the cost statute as we're requesting here under, again, the cost statute. Well, but, so, but the, your opposition suggests, well, wait a minute, you don't qualify for reimbursement uh, under 8539, and I think you agree with that. Correct. You, because of the sequencing. Correct. Um, and so how, <laughs> the, the argument is, well, your interpretation of, uh, of the rule and 8640 eviscerates the limitations in 8539. How do you respond? All right, um, I respond in three ways. Uh, the first is that this is 8640 is an expression of the legislature in terms of what it uh, and intended. So is 8539, I take it. Right, but 8539 requires uh, an examination and, and first of all requires a rating by, doc by their doctor, by the defense doctor, and then um, uh, rating by our doctor, the claimant's doctor, and that's automatically reimbursed. Under 8640, there's quite a bit of discretion, and the commissioner may or may not um, reimburse that examination at all. It may only reimburse what he deems to be a reasonable cost of that examination. It may only uh, reimburse the, the report, the actual piece of paper from that examination. So it's quite a bit of discretion under 8540 as opposed to 8539. Well, counsel, uh, going back to the chief's question, um, uh, I guess one of, the, one of the things we need to try to figure out is what is included in the cost of obtaining the report. So uh, it's been a while since I was in the practice, uh, but uh, you know, in, in recent years, um, when a, a provider uh, submits a report, um, are they including in that cost uh, time for reviewing the patient's records, for example? Well, to, to get to your question, um, some do and some don't. Uh, reviewing uh, the records of other providers, perhaps? And some do and some don't. In this case, Dr. Sokin didn't break it down. So there's no evidence in this case of what the discrete costs were for each phase of her examination. So defense counsel would have you not pay her at all uh, under 8640. Um, I'm, I'm suggesting that because the, the cost of the re obtaining the report is individual, or excuse me, indivisible. In other words, she had to do, review the records, she had to perform the examination, she had to come to opinions, and then she had to um, form a report, that those are all in one costs, and we can't divide them. And so if we can't divide them, then the only rationale, if there's no 8539 mechanism uh, to get this reimbursed is through 8640, the reasonable cost. Now, it's important to know that um, Mr. Jenkins never challenged the reasonableness of this cost. 
So if you're alarmed at the $2,800, uh, it could be $28. It, it didn't matter what the number is. We're not here to debate the number because that was never challenged. What does the term cost mean? We're, we're, all, we're all in the language here. Uh, provides for reasonable cost of obtaining reports. Um, what's your argument that cost includes examination? Well, as I just said, the, Dr. Sokin didn't break it down. So the cost of obtaining a report, not the cost of a report, it's the cost of obtaining a report uh, is the, the magic language, so to speak, that allows 8640 to, if 8539 is not available, to um, award uh, reimbursement of at, well, at cost, uh, let me get, let's, let me go back to the statute then, uh, 8540, it talks about co costs being recovered. In the, in the federal court system, costs is a term of art that's very narrowly defined. Um, and very narrowly defined, frankly. I mean, it includes um, uh, filing fees, it includes copying costs and so forth, but it ordinarily does not include uh, expert witness expenses. Um, why shouldn't that narrow gloss be imported into 8540 and subsequent rules? 8640 uh, was a, a creature of the legislature uh, and Pursuant to that, um, the rule 40.33 was created. Uh, this is not federal court. This is work comp court. And work comp court uh, is wide open in terms of the flexibility of the commissioner to, uh, in his discretion, which is what the legislature afforded under 8640. It said the leg to the commissioner, you have discretion to promulgate rules. He promulgated the rule, and there's a whole laundry list of costs, including expert witness costs. Uh, which can be uh, um, uh, given to by the commissioner. So the 4.33 subsection 6, the cost, uh, the reasonable cost of obtaining a medical or practitioner's report is very broad in our view. Is this, is this an all or nothing case? You Meaning? either get all the $2,800 or you get nothing? Yes. And, and the, the other side hasn't argued, at least I can't see that, only certain parts of that 2800 is compensable. I don't believe they are. They, I don't believe they have. They haven't in the written, written information. And our argument is certainly contained also in that written information that the cost is indivisible. You either get it all or you get nothing. <clears throat> Good end. So, so is another way to express your, your position um, that the meaning of obtaining in uh, Rule 4.33 is whatever the commissioner says it means? Is that kind of what your argument is? So, so if the commissioner thinks it's reasonable under a given set of circumstances to include the cost of time spent doing an examination before preparing the report or reviewing uh, the medical records of another provider or uh, perhaps even some deposition testimony of fact witnesses, perhaps even some um, some surveillance reports that the commissioner could consider that all of that time as part of the reasonable uh, cost of obtaining the report? Is that what your position is? 8640, uh, you know, uh, by the legislature, gives the commissioner a very broad discretion in terms of what they can include. And it's up to commissioner by commissioner, and believe me, it varies um, in terms of what they think they want to include in that report. Some commissioners just give you the, the paper copy of the report. Iowa's I uh, employer has the right to cho choose physicians. And I think this um, independent medical exam piece is that they don't want you to get another physician's sort of nose into the, into the tent until such time as the employer's physician has finished treated, rated, and then they'll give you the, the one bite at the apple to get the independent. It seems to me that your um, argument actually undercuts that because it gives the employee a right to get a medical exam in connection with a report um, to be assessed against the employer. And that seems to bother me. Why am I wrong about well, that? Well, because what happens in practice, and I've been at this 23 years, is that employers don't want to pay for the ratings. So they don't get the ratings. 
And I, as a claimant's attorney, have, have been in this area a long, long time, and I, I struggle every day with employers who won't get ratings. And if they don't get the rating, then I, as Mr. Matson did in this case, have to leapfrog the process. And we have to get our own rating so that we can go to hearing. And uh, what happened in this case is Mr. Matson exactly did that. He leapfrogged the process. And then that spawned interest by the defense in getting a rating. So uh, it's the cart before the horse. And it's not a case of 8539. 90% uh, of my cases go the, exactly the way you indicated where the defense attorney gets the rating, uh, I get my rating, and then we go to hearing. Uh, Isn't there another remedy, or rather than just hauling off and getting an independent medical, is to ask the commissioner for them to provide you with a rating? That remedy is not available. Uh, the only remedy available is an alternate medical care hearing, but that's a whole separate uh, kettle of fish. But wouldn't that be okay because they're not providing with a rating? Well, and the that's something that you have, or they say there's no permanency, and then that's, that's a rating, and no rating is a rating. Right, exactly. Um, and what's happened in these cases is, it's not just my case or Gary Matson's case, um, the defense attorneys uh, routinely delay in these cases. And if it, they delay, then there is that remedy that we can get it under, actually, 8539. Um, the cases have held, especially the case of Creason, has held that uh, in a number of cases where uh, the uh, defendants delayed in getting uh, re uh, reports to us or impairment ratings. Uh, it's okay to leapfrog, and then that is uh, compensable under 8539. I'm not arguing that here. But, uh, but the cases under Creason, which are all cited in my brief and in uh, the amicus brief, um, all go to the point that this is a common occurrence from defense attorneys. They delay. Let me ask you this quick question. Uh, I know your time is up, but uh, the stat, the one of the relevant statutes here, 8640, provides that the commissioner may assess the costs uh, of the hearing uh, before the commission, doesn't it? Well, the, the only costs that can be assessed are, they, he can assess the cost to the defense, he can assess the cost to the claimant, or he can assess the cost equally. It, 8640 says, all costs incurred in the hearing before the commissioner that, shall be taxed in the discretion of the commissioner. And that's typically the hearing transcript. Uh, is, is this a cost incurred? in the hearing before the commissioner? I would say it was in preparation for the hearing and not in the hearing itself. But, uh, you know, that's a liberal interpretation uh, of that rule. All right, thank you. Mr. Jenkins. May it please the court, counsel. To a degree, I agree with Mr. Tucker's statement about the, <clears throat> the issue before us today. It's whether the commissioner may continue to be allowed to uh, cause employers to pay the cost for independent medical examinations taxed as a cost under agency rule if the claimant is for some reason not uh, able to uh, fall under the, the requirements of Section 8539. Uh, I've heard for the first time today, uh, it's not in any of the previous briefs or the recitation of facts, this issue about uh, someone demanding uh, uh, an, that an impairment rating be provided. <clears throat> in fact, there wasn't any, to my knowledge, any defense counsel involved back in the spring of 2010. Certainly I wasn't, and I'm the only defense counsel that has been involved in this case. And I think the, the, the only the problem here was that the treating physician had not yet determined Ms. Young to have reached maximum medical improvement. And there can't be a rating given until that happens. Let me change the facts a little. You know, in this case, the doctor was required to do a physical exam to give her report. What happens, what happens in the case where the claimant attorney just sends out records and says, can you give him a report on this and tell me 
um, and they get a rating out of it. You can do all kinds of stuff with just records, especially if there's a lot of objective stuff in there. Um, would that be compensable under this statute, um, even though there was no rating from the employer first? I, I think it probably would be based on the notion that that is a report and doesn't involve a physical examination. But that seems to be form <coughs> over substance, and it seems to me that you, you would concede that the report part of what the doctor did should be payable and not the exam part. So it, it, it seems to be ridiculous to try to, you know, to say if, if the person walks in the office and, and gets a pulse or gives a history or whatever, it's not compensable, but if they don't, it's based just on records, it is. And that's sort of a hard line to draw here. Well, the reports can be any number of things. It may be the claimant's attorney writing the treating doctor. And what I see frequently is it's the claimant attorney that writes the treating doctor to request the impairment rating that then is used by the claimant to go get the IME. And it may be that's all that is requested and it's a couple hundred dollars. So, uh, but I don't think it's form over substance if the result essentially nullifies a statute. I don't think this is a section 8640 case in, in any respect. That one How does it nullify the statute? Help me with that. Because the statute has prerequisites to the, the claimant's entitlement to reimbursement. You have, uh, you have 8539 that's a mandatory provision. It says you will get costs under these circumstances if the em employer gets a rating first and then you go get your own rating. Then you have 8640 which says commissioner has discretion on costs and, and the rule seems to say the same thing. Here is a set of costs that may be awarded. So how does having, uh, how, uh, it st seems to me this still gives meaning to the statute because the statute's mandatory and then you have a separate discretionary provision. Well, but the discretion can't be unfettered. Uh, I happen to be looking at the McSpadden versus Big Ben Coal Company case uh, recently for another reason and referencing another agency workers' compensation rule, the court, Supreme Court said an agency rule to be valid cannot be either inconsistent with statutory language or legislative intent. And I think section uh, 8539 has been uh, interpreted by this court to reflect a fairly narrow legislative intent as to when an employee may uh, be reimbursed by the employer it's not or made. a physical it's exam at their choice. Uh, 8539 is mandatory reimbursement. And it, it, if I understand the intent right, and please help I, me with I this. I think you're right if they meet the prerequisites. If they meet the prerequisites. And the notion, the notion behind 8539 is that a little bit, you balance the scales a little bit, the, com the, the, the worker might not have quite the same resources and so forth. And so we're going to, frankly, force the employer, I mean, it's a mandatory provision, we're going to force the employer under a limited set of circumstances to pay for an independent medical exam. It's a, it's a little unusual, uh, but, but 8540 is a, is a discretionary provision, and it allows costs to be reimbursed when surely in the reasonable discretion uh, of the commissioner, uh, it would be appropriate to do so. Um, if, if it looked like the um, complainant was trying to play a game of some kind, I mean, I, we, we assume that the commissioner would be smart enough and say, well, I'm not going to reimburse you under that state of facts because you, you filed your, your claim and three days later you got your independent medical and you were, you know, you're horsing around the system. I'm not going to do it. Um, but isn't there a difference between a mandatory provision 8539 and the, and the discretionary provision of, of 8640. But if the mandatory provision cannot be used. Everybody agrees it cannot be used. And the claimant uses the discretionary provision to obtain the same result, then the limitations in the mandatory provision meant nothing. But you, you said earlier though that if uh, independent medical was done without an examination, 
In other words, I sent all the records from the treating physician and the hospital records and all the prior records and everything else, and that doctor gives me a rating without doing an examination of the person. You said that would be compensable, and it, it just doesn't make sense to draw that line um, under that circumstance. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd refer, Your Honor, to the, the agency decision in the House case that's mentioned in our brief, and I think uh, Deputy Commissioner Heitland, sitting as a designee, then uh, wrote it pretty well to, to demonstrate the differences between an 8539 exam under the statute and what the agency rules should have meant by a report. And also, if you look at the decision in, in Caven, I thought it was interesting that the Court of Appeals in the printed decision uh, italicized the words report and physical examination as the, the reasoning was going back and forth to decide where, where that should land. In fact, it landed on the report side because there's uh, it was done by an audiologist who is not a physician, and that's one of the requirements of 8539. And also, there's no indication that there was any physical examination. <coughs> so uh, it, it was appropriate there to be used as a report. And, and that case itself it doesn't have any real significance to this one other than the practical effect of removing the $150 limitation. And so that's a big deal here. So, counsel. <coughs> I want to go back to a question uh, that I asked Mr. Tucker, and that is, uh, you know, what, what, what is your view of the um, commissioner's discretion in terms of what, what he includes, or she maybe someday, uh, includes in the, in the definition of the costs for obtaining a report? Does it include time spent examining the claimant's own records? that the provider is, has generated? I assume it does. Uh, does it include uh, perhaps reviewing, the time spent reviewing other providers' records? You're saying it would? I, I, I would believe so. If, it, if it's material that was provided to the doctor, uh, I'm presuming we're talking about a doctor, that, that you know, the, the doctor evaluated the background material and we'll review the questions asked by counsel usually and, and write a report. That seems to me to potentially uh, fall in the rule or within the scope of the rule. I'm not necessarily sure that the word obtaining should have any particular meaning. Uh, uh, again, looking back at Caven, I think the court was trying to say there's a, a distinction between cases involving just reports and cases involving physical examination. Well, that's what I'm trying to, to, trying to get at. Um, it, would it be your position that um, uh, the cost of, of obtaining a report that includes any time that the physician spent examining the patient, his own patient, before writing the report uh, would be a deal breaker that it could not, could not be included? In, in the cost of obtaining the report? Is that your position? Well, if it, I would think that that will fall in the scope of what Deputy Heitland was saying in-house, that the independent medical examination is a bit of a unique uh, uh, examination different than the, the standard report. Once you start doing the examination, then you fall within the statute. And technically, if you look at the statute, it doesn't say anything about reports. The, the employer eventually gave, the employer's doctor eventually gave a rating in this case, did they That's not? That's correct. And if they would have waited till after that rating came down and, and did all this stuff, you wouldn't be here today. So how are you prejudiced? Because they'd be entitled to an independent medical report uh, and you paying for it at some time. So they did a little early, but you'd still have to pay for it if they asked for it. So how is there any prejudice, you know, in this case that caused us to do anything? Well, the integrity of the statute is at issue, and, and I don't think you can have that pushed aside because in this one case, had the, the sequence of events changed, we wouldn't be here. We have lots of cases where the jury instruction may be wrong, but we say it didn't prejudice the outcome. We have lots of cases where procedure got sort of backwards, and we say they weren't prejudiced by it because they'd have to pay for it anyway. So I don't, 
and, and I don't if, understand where the prejudice here, even if you're right, that you're entitled to any relief. And if that happened, we wouldn't be, we would have a justiciable controversy to argue the point. Pre-Caven, when the agency itself imposed a $150 cost limit on reports under the rule, the, the claimant might have obtained a, a report such as this under the same sequence. It might have been a full-blown IME that cost $1,000. But all, if they sought cost, they would only be awarded 150 And the employer could go out and get an exam if they hadn't had a treaty. It was a denied claim and they never had a treating physician. They might go get a report and it might have cost $1,000, but if they sought cost, it would only be 150 So if the claimant lost, the claimant potentially was on the hook to eat their own 150 and pay 150 for the employer's report if the commissioner chose uh, in his or her discretion to tax that. Once the $150 limit came off, now we're talking about IMEs in the range of two to $5,000. And <coughs> it's not be, just this but they'd case. they'd be entitled to one anyway under the facts of this case if they would have waited 30 days or 90 days? I think that the, apart from maintaining the integrity of the statute and the interpretation of the statute and the encroachment on that by the rule or the commissioner's use of the rule, I think it's, it's a significant issue going forward because you multiply this $2,800 that we don't believe the claimant was entitled to receive on her choice oh, if we rule this way in your favor, I would think that anybody who does workers' comp wouldn't get the second report until after they got the rating from the employer doctor. So I don't think this is, has a significant effect in the future, and I, I don't think this is going to change the outcome of the case substantively, and I don't think this is going to change the, the fact that you have to pay for the independent medical, and, and that's what's bothering me. Well, and not in every case will uh, uh, an employee be entitled to an IME. It's only where a physician retained by the employer has provided the requisite rating. And, and if it's a denied case, they're never going to be entitled to that. So how can they end up coming around to the cost rule and, and receiving the full amount of the cost? But that's the not IME? this case. This case, there was a rating. Whether there was or it wasn't, the, the rule was violated by the fact that she obtained her rating before there what was is, one. What is the proper process then when we talked about earlier, what is the proper process if the employer simply stonewalls and says, well, I, don't, I deny, I'm not gonna do anything. Is the proper process then to make application to the, to the commissioner and then they can order you to have a medical exam or do this or otherwise, that, I don't know. I, I, that's why I'm asking, I guess. What, what's your remedy? under those circumstances, which I think are the facts here, uh, whether it was an intentional delay or uh, I'm not making uh, a judgment about that, but what, what is the remedy then? Well, the, the amicus brief pointed out a remedy the commissioner is already using, and that is in cases where there has been an authorized treating physician retained by the employer, and that employer uh, uh, releases the claimant to work without restrictions, then that has been deemed a rating of functional impairment likely zero. And based on that deemed or assumed rating, the agency has held that the, the claimant is entitled uh, to a Section 8539 IME. There can be variations of that a doctor may be asked only to provide an opinion on causation. Is this person's problem related to a work injury? And they say no. You know, it, should that be a deemed rating? There, there are different versions of it. But the commissioner has found a way if, in fact, for some reason, the defense, uh, the, the employer, the insurance carrier has not asked the question of the doctor. The practical solution is, as I have seen in many, many cases, where the claimant's attorney asks the doctor. And if it happened to be a doctor that the employer had paid for, then it falls under that. Okay, counsel, should, is the cleanest way to decide this that we apply the rule that the more specific statute ap 
applies over the general, and 8539 is the only statute that specifically addresses IMEs, and it and their cost recovery should rise or fall under the plain language of that statute, which would trump the administrative rule. I, I, I think that's exactly right, and <clears throat> that statute is certainly more specific than 8640, which in one sentence I think only suggests that the commissioner may assess cost only discretionarily as opposed to mandatorily. Uh, and, and we haven't challenged, and I'm not sure there has been a challenge of the various components of the cost rule itself as to whether that truly follows the statute, which as the chief indicated, uh, you know, refers only to uh, costs at the hearing. So there's a whole area of that, but I, I, I truly believe you're correct that the more specific statute that addresses the entitlement to the independent medical examination is 8539, and that should trump it. Council, uh, uh, assume for the sake of this question that, um, that Dr. Stokin's report said nothing about 8539, said didn't, didn't use the words independent medical exam. Assume further that uh, her statement, is it, is it Dr. Stokin a woman or a man? I don't. Uh, a, a woman. A woman. Assume she, she, when she sent her bill for the service, she didn't make any reference to independent medical exam. Uh, assuming those facts, would it then have been uh, appropriate uh, for the claimant to seek uh, uh, this element of cost under 8640 and Rule 4.33? I don't think the label itself is important. Dr. Is, is, is that in part because we, the, the, the words independent medical exam are kind of thrown around casually and, and sometimes medical doctors use those terms without really understanding what the significance is? I, I think so. I mean, the words independent medical exam actually aren't used in the statute. Right. And, and the first paragraph, a numbered paragraph of the statute, refers to uh, the employer's right to have the, the claimant examined, and that's sometimes known colloquially as a defense IME. Uh, it, it's Dr. Stokin's report in its form and content is absolutely identical to the scores of other of her reports I've seen that properly are written in the sequence for 8539, but she, if she had done the same thing without the label, I think it would have we could have developed other information, I suppose, to show that, that there's no difference between what she did other than not using the label. I think it's the examination part because all 8539 talks about is the right to a subsequent examination. But in that context, again, assuming that there was no reference to an independent medical exam or a, a bill for that, uh, you'd then be cast into a position of fighting about what's the reasonable charge for obtaining her report, right? And taxing it as a cost. And you'd then be fighting about whether uh, her time spent examining the patient was a necessary part of obtaining the report, fair? It, it is, but as a practical matter, and that's one of the downstream implications of this, if, if Claimants can go out and get these reports with a, an expectation that whether they follow the statute or not, if they win, uh, they're going to get this taxed, is that we would spend more money trying to answer those questions than, than the, perhaps the report is worth, unless it was one of the $5,000 reports. And that's why the significance of CAVEN, when we switched from 150 to this, now, now it's an important uh, issue because of the amount of the cost involved. And I think it has a chilling effect, frankly, on the potential outcome of the case at the agency level. Because if a claimant feels they can go out and do this and, and have the report taxed, at the end, if they're successful, and the deputy is looking at how much the claimant has invested, and maybe they, they, they have a vocational report, and. Uh, you know, the costs are there. Now, Mr. Jenkins, I, I know your time's up, I'm so I'm going to ask the question of you, and I won't take up any Mr. Tucker's time then, but um, I know that the commissioner 
decided the identical issue that presented before us today. Uh, and that was submitted to the commissioner in the course of the hearing, is that right? Uh, yes, the issue was presented at hearing. The deputy commissioner ruled this way. Right. The commissioner affirmed on okay. appeal. Okay. When was that issue, whether the independent medical exam report could be taxed as a court cost? When was that? When were you first notified that was an issue? And, and how were you know how did that get how did that come into the case well as a practical matter I think we we, we knew it even sometime before the petition was filed uh, you know the petition wasn't filed until almost nine months or so after the IME was obtained and that's when about the time that I be became involved and I, I I identified the issue at that time I knew the, the issue is in the pre-hearing report I know it, it is indicated on the, the hearing report that was submitted to the deputy, yes. Okay, and it was all, the issue was from the beginning was presented as one of whether or not it could be taxed as costs and it was never an issue seeking for reimbursement of the expenses of the examination? I, I, I have to refresh myself by looking at the hearing report. It may have been presented alternatively as either an IME or a cost on the hearing report I, I know that in my post-hearing brief to the deputy, we said this does not qualify under 8539, and we argued it should not be then taxed as a cost as an end run around the statute. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tucker, you can present your rebuttal. <clears throat> Council spends a great deal of time talking about the Caven case. I implore you to read that case. In that case, at the Court of Appeals level, um, the, <clears throat> the exam, if you call it that, was done telephonically. So whether the exam was done in person or whether it was done by telephone, um, the examiner, <coughs> E, the examiner, the, um, an audiologist, saw some records, made contact with the client, um, formed opinions and wrote a report. Same thing here. The, the conclusion in Caven is what I want you to look at. It says in that case that this application of this taxing statute is not an irrational, illogical, or wholly unjustifiable um, interpretation of law. So all you have to do is take that case and, and adopt it, basically, and that would be um, a, a good way to, to, to rule in this case. Mr. Jenkins also talked about a house case, the house v. Um, CC distributing, I think it is. Uh, that house case was specifically overruled as a precedent in this case. And the, the, the uh, appeal decision says the, that that case is, is no longer valid agency precedent. So that's the only case they have to uh, defend here. And what the commissioner has said is that that's a no longer a valid agency precedent. Rather, what is valid agency precedent? It's that you can use the, the taxing statute as a way to obtain, uh, pay for, reimburse the reasonable cost of obtaining a doctor's report. Now, there was some comment on by the court about whether a specific uh, statute trumps a non-specific statute. And the fact is that the language of 8640 uh, is very specific. It says that you can get the reasonable cost, which, by the way, was never challenged by defense, uh, of a, a practitioner or medical report, of obtaining a, a practitioner's or medical report. Uh, and 8630, or excuse me, 8539 deals with a whole separate issue. That's an examination regarding disability. So uh, I, I think they're both specific is what I guess I'm getting at. Uh, and one uh, is neither more specific than, than the other. Well, in, in, in that regard, um, 8640 is the governing statute that, that says that um, all costs incurred in a hearing before the commissioner 
shall be taxed in the current in the commissioner's discretion. But um, eighty five thirty nine the independent medical examination statute permits you to make an application to the commissioner to be reimbursed for the expenses of a medical examination and I think even to get transportation right. expenses. So it seems like the legislature knows the difference between the expenses associated with an examination, which is the independent medical exam statute, and then a statute dealing with the taxation of, of the costs of a, of a hearing. How is the examine, the independent medical examination tied to the costs of a hearing when the legislature has made this separation? I think the legislature has, and I don't want to speak for the legislature, but the legislature has made a, a, a whole statute under Chapter 85. Parts of that statute deal with subsequent examinations when a defense examination has been made first, and then the subsequent examination by the claimant. Part of that statute also deals with what happens when that doesn't apply, when 8539 doesn't apply as here. How do we get that reimbursed? And under 8640, uh, you can get reimbursed the reasonable cost of obtaining a medical report. And as I said before, some of that's just the report itself. Some of it's the exam and the report. Some of it's even the transportation expenses to the exam. Uh, but it, it has to be uh, itemized. In this case, Dr. Stoken, in her wisdom, didn't itemize her, her report expenses. So it's an all or nothing case. We get either the 2800 or we get nothing. <clears throat> Mr. Jenkins begins his uh, comments by saying, if, if you adopt um, the Court of Appeals decision, it will nullify the statute. Well, it, it, nothing, no statute gets nullified here. Okay? <laughs> we're, we're dealing with an 8640. That's the sole question before you. And what happens under that statute if these expenses can be reimbursed in this way? That's the sole point of consideration. Uh, and I think I'm out of time. And I thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you as well, Mr. Tucker, and for both arguments. Uh, the case is submitted, and we'll now hear the arguments in Iowa Insurance Institute.